Hello, I'm Dr. Diana Bittner of True Women's Health, and this is Dr. Jim Simon. I'm very honored that he has joined us today. Good to be here. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the topic that comes up so often um, about hormone, hormone replacement therapy, and that it's safer than you think. So, so excited to bring up this topic. Um, we'd like to keep this very informal. So for those of you who are watching live, please feel free to ask lots of questions and we'll just, uh, it's okay to interrupt and we'll just sort of bring them up as they come. Um, any questions, any comments, you know, please share. We've got a couple questions that our patients ask us a lot. We're ready to go if uh, there's not a lot from the audience. And again, please share this with your friends and family afterwards because it will be um, recorded on YouTube and on um, Facebook. And so you can watch this after the fact. And so how I always like to get started is why have I asked Dr. Simon to come from Washington, D.C. to join us, as well as why is this important to me? And we, we know every woman will go through menopause. 80% um, of women have symptoms and we don't want women to suffer. And so that's why we're here, here to talk about this. Jim, why are you here to talk about this? So I'm here to talk about this to support you and True Women's Health, but also because I'm really passionate about this subject. Um, about 20 years ago now, the big women's health initiative study, the study, that old it. study, whatever uh, you remember, the WHI. The WHI came out, and just after that, I was the president of the North American Menopause Society. I'm sure that was a challenge. It was a um, proverbial you-know-what storm. So I had to deal with those things, and I was not a big supporter of the results of that study. I interpreted them a very different way. I was more the glass-half-full guy rather than the glass-half-empty okay. person. And, um, and that's really defined my practice of medicine and reproductive endocrinology for the last 20 sure. years. Right. And, and, you know, in terms of the hormones, it's like fear. We think of what sells newspapers, right? It's either fear or hope. And the fear of hormones just drove such a torrent of change. I know before that study came out, what, 70% of women in the U.S. were on hormone um, medication. And after it dropped to 20% within how many months? eight, nine months? Yeah, it, w it was really the bottom dropped out of the market, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And now it's only about five to 10% of eligible women who could use hormones are actually on them. Uh, and that's a problem because that's clearly too few. One could argue that before the Women's Health Initiative, maybe it was a little too much. Maybe it was a little too much. And uh, I think the pendulum needs to find the proper middle ground and we're not there. Right. And why we're talking about this is that you might not know about the study, but you might ask your mom, hey, are you on hormones? Well, no, hormones are bad. I mean, that tends to be the fear. And you might not know why she's saying that, but she was reading those newspaper headlines when that study came out. And again, the study was a really good study. It was an elegant study. It was very thorough. But what happened when that study came out is a lot of us practicing traditional medicine doctors I'm sure you read the study. I did not. I was too busy delivering babies. I didn't take the time to read the study. So I dropped the ball. And so instead of really looking at the data and knowing why and you know who would, who would be safe to take the medication, I just kept delivering babies. Yeah. The other part of that is that there was a rush to judgment, I believe, by the media and by the people that did the study to get the word out, they had uh, spent a billion dollars in taxpayer money or so, and they wanted to have something to show for the work that they had put in. And so there were, like many headlines, lumping of endpoints and lumping of findings, much to homogenization of the fact that hormones were still really good for younger po postmenopausal women really bad for older postmenopausal women who never really were getting them beforehand anyway. And so overall, the results were that hormones were bad for you when in fact, the younger women uh, were lumped in good, yeah. and it was really the wrong message for them. So what the study really shows us is that it's, it tells us who can have hormones in terms of who it's safe for, who gets the most benefit and who for whom it might cause harm. 
um, a study that was done a couple years ago, Dr. Wild and Dr. Manson, was yeah. really critical in terms of who were the women who had bad outcomes. And those were the women who had metabolic syndrome. And so we talk about that at True, and it's a syndrome of women who have a large waist circumference, so they have belly fat, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and high cholesterol. And, and looking at, at those characteristics, if women have metabolic syndrome, then maybe that would be somebody who we would look at alternatives to treat her symptoms and maybe not hormone medications, especially not oral synthetic oral hormones. Yeah, I think the other thing uh, that was a problem in the study was that the study was meant to determine whether hormones were good for your heart. It wasn't about hot flashes or, or night sweats cancer. or breast cancer. Those were all alternative endpoints. It was, could we prevent heart attacks in women who were started on hormones? And so women with metabolic syndrome, women with obesity, women who were overweight, smokers, et cetera, and at have. higher risk of having a cardiovascular event, a heart attack. They were preferentially enrolled, in fact, to see if hormones could reduce it. So we know that if woman has, let's say, already an unhealthy heart or blockage, then the hormones could actually increase the risk of a heart attack. But if she's got a good heart, like right now I have a low calcium score, I know my, I'm good, hormones are going to help my heart stay healthier, my vessels stay open longer. And that's good data from the elite trial, right? So we know that, so it's good. So let's back up a little bit. So why do we even talk about hormones? So we talk about hormones because of menopause. What's menopause? It's when our estrogen, our ovaries stop making estrogen, they're retired. They're not making any more estrogen. Um, even in perimenopause, when there are some months, there's some estrogen, some months there's not, there can be a reason to maybe start the hormones for let's say for symptoms and, you know, we know how to do that. But, you know, what happens when our estrogen levels drop, right? There's estrogen receptors everywhere in our body. And right. those receptors hang on to estrogen. They turn around, go into the cell and make the cell do something. So they can make our bone cells build good bone. They can keep our, the, the cells that line our blood vessels, they can keep them from being potentially inflamed. They help the skin of the vagina be nice and thick. So what am I forgetting? Oh, they, they help your brain cells grow. They improve sleep. Uh, that's another central nervous system function. Uh, hormones are incredibly important in sex and sexual function and mood and whole cadre of different endpoints we in medicine tend to think very concretely about them. Yes, it's good for bones. It's good for blood vessels. It's good for these things. But those have downstream effects on that woman as a whole and how she functions in her life, in her job, in her uh, marriage, in her general interactions, the multitude of effects of hormones, both direct and indirect. And, and one study I think is really important that, that just came out showed that how many women leave the workforce when menopause hits, because I, I, and, and that fits because maybe they're tired, they're not in a good mood, they're, they're, they're really challenged. And so there's a higher rate of absenteeism where women aren't showing up to work and presenteeism, which means you're at work physically, but you're really not there. So you're there, but you're not there. I see a question come up and I wanna show it here. Um, Pamela, sorry about my face close to the screen here. How do I find a good doc as you approach menopause? So Pamela, that's a great question. So of course, if you're in Michigan, I hope you come to True Women's Health, um, or if you're in DC to see Dr. Simon at Intima Medicine, um, and the links are on the side. But if you're not in any of those areas, we recommend that you go to the website, menopause.org, and we'll put the link up there on the side. And you can look for a certified menopause practitioner in your area. And so it's just absolutely critical to see someone who knows what they're doing. Um, you know, not all of us OBGYNs or primary care docs can take out the time to do the extra training. And so if you're talking to your own doc about it, at least to get started, and then also to work with a certified menopause practitioner to help guide the treatment. The test is actually 
pretty difficult. And so one has to really know their stuff to pass the test and be a certified provider. Yep, yep. that's true. I'm sure Dr. Simon helped write the test. I did write the test. Yeah. So there you go. So um, it's pretty intense. So for us OBs, the internal medicine part of it is not uh, the easiest. And you know, for internal medicine, they have to learn some gynecology, but it's all good. But, but again, that's a really good resource. And another question from Sue, just started menopause this past February, turned 60 in June. Good to hear your talk about menopause, taking it early. So it looks like that's more of a statement. So thank you, Sue, for that. But yes, it's so important to talk about this and it can make such a difference. I had a patient who uh, messaged back about two weeks after she started hormones and she said, oh my God, I feel like a girl again. You know, so there's something to that. But that takes me back to what I was going to say about menopause being this perfect storm. Um, so keep the question up there from Camille. But I think about this like a perfect storm. We have the symptoms of menopause, poor sleep, hot flashes, night sweats, mood stuff, lower sex drive, lower ability to become aroused um, when those sexual cues um, or that right partner is, is present. But the those symptoms are here. And then we have the physiological changes, right? So we have the insulin resistance, easier to gain belly fat. We have the um, cholesterols going up. And so all of that together makes this perfect storm where most women in that first year of menopause gain 15 to 20 pounds. Kind of like being in a COVID pandemic. <laughs> kind of like that. Although, yes, yeah, some people chose to get healthier during the COVID pandemic. Camille, how do you make sure of correct estrogen replacement? Thoughts about the biweekly patch? So I'll just say, Camille, I'm on the biweekly patch, not to be TMI, but the biweekly patch for me just is nice and easy. It keeps my level stable. I preferentially, I don't like the weekly patch because it's just, it's big and, and I don't like that. Um, and some brands of the generic tend to stick a little bit better than other brands. So it's finding that right brand. Um, but it's very important to make sure that if you have a uterus and you take estrogen, that you also take progesterone. And we prefer the bioidentical FDA approved progesterone. Um, but it's all about symptoms. Jim, what would you say about this? Yeah. So I think that uh, most women um, can do, if they're young and healthy, can use a patch. They can use a transdermal gel. They can use a vaginal ring. And if they're healthy, they actually can use an oral, oral estrogen. Um, if there are concerns about general health, cardiovascular health, uh, blood clots, or those issues from one's history, then we tend to shy away from all oral hormone therapy. But you know what, I, just I'm going to stop you on that, because what I do love is that the company Therapeutics that came up with the oral um, combination by Juva did some really good research on blood clotting factor. So we know that when someone takes oral estrogen, oral estrogen in a pill, it goes through the liver first. It doesn't go straight into the blood. And so therefore it can affect clotting factors that are made by the liver. And so again, we're just so much more comfortable with the patch because that's what we've always used. But at least I'm very reassured by the data that came out of the study that they did for 12 months on this oral combination of, it's called Bijuva. So it's oral estrogen and oral progesterone together. The great side effect of that progesterone is that it really can help with sleep as a nice side effect. Yeah. So the, that particular formulation is the only formulation available that contains both a natural form of estrogen, estradiol, and a natural form of progesterone, progesterone, and in one capsule. And uh, Dr. Bittner is correct in uh, mentioning that that formulation may be a little different in terms of its risk of blood clots. So it may be a special exception. And a safer thing. So thank you to that. So Camille said progesterone necessary with no uterus. No, Camille, it's not. So if you don't have a uterus, so I want you to think about the lining of the uterus is like your lawn. Estrogen's fertilizer and progesterone is weed killer. So if you don't have a lawn, you don't have to take weed killer. But for women who have a uterus, it's really important not to take estrogen by itself because that over time could lead to uterine cancer. So again, Camille, if you don't have a uterus, you're good. Um, Beth asks, my PCP has encouraged me to try to affect her to treat my hot flashes as my only intolerable symptom. So I have two comments on that. Um, he wants me to try this before hormones. Your thoughts, I don't love the potential. So the thing about Effexor, first of all, and, and Jim, feel free to interrupt, but Effexor was the first non-hormone medication that people use to treat hot flashes. And the problem is, is that Effexor at the lower dose, 75 milligrams, that doesn't have a lot of side effects, 
doesn't tend to get to the serotonin receptors. And so it's really not that effective for hot flashes. If you go up to the 150, there's more side effects, but maybe it helps with hot flashes. If a woman, for example, has breast cancer and it's not safe for her to take systemic estrogen, then I would go to Alexapro, which has been shown in head-to-head -head trials with effects are to be more effective. So if, if, that, if hormones are not an option for you because of safety, I would tend to go to Lexapro and really look at the, the, at your lifestyle. My other comment on that, and I know Jim's got a comment ready to go, but you know, your only intolerable symptom. I would ask, why do you have to tolerate anything? And even if hot flashes are the only noticeable symptom, there's a lot going on under the hood. So I'm a car freak. So I think about things with car analogies, but you know, you look under the hood, there's more going on. So you know, with a loss of estrogen, again, we're thinking about your heart, your bones, your skin, your brain. And so under the hood, there's a lot going on. And why wait on estrogen? So I, I, I don't know a single person, male or female, that doesn't like a BOGO. Buy one, get one. Okay? <laughs> Who doesn't like a BOGO? So think about that when you're thinking about what we just spoke about under the hood. What are the other issues besides the one that's most obvious? And maybe, for example, a woman's having hot flashes and needs an antidepressant because she's depressed. Well, maybe she can get a BOGO from using Effexor or Lexapro. On the other hand, maybe that menopausal woman is having hot flashes and loss of interest in sex for which the antidepressants are particularly bad. So she doesn't want to be on that. Let's say she can't sleep in addition to her hot flashes. Maybe she is better on estrogen than on Effexor, but maybe for that patient, because progesterone has a good sedative effect, and Dr. Bittner is absolutely correct, you don't need it if you don't have a uterus, but it's probably more natural to use progesterone as a sleeping pill than it is to use a sleeping pill. So buy one, get one, or three if you can. Yeah, I love that. And the other thing too is that I understand a lot of times, again, primary care docs, they have to do so much and know so much. So all the respect, but again, why wait? And, and a lot of times, again, you know, doctors, of course, are going to be very risk averse, right? We take an oath, first do no harm. But in terms of risk, it's really important to really know your risk factors. And so if you have risk factors, sure, let's try other stuff. But if you don't have risk factors, why wait? We know that estrogen has most benefit it's if it's taken in the first five to six years of menopause. So we don't want you to wait and suffer through. Um, life is too valuable. I think that's one thing we've learned. And there's one other little comment about Effexor specifically. There's a subgroup of women, probably around 10% of women, who can take Effexor and it'll help their hot flashes, but then they have sweating different from their hot flashes, unrelated to their hot flashes, that is a unique side effect of Effexor. So if someone has night sweats and in addition to their hot flashes, we really don't know. Is it the Effexor? Is it the hot flashes? Is it the mixture? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah. And so what I want to do, and then Carolyn, I see your question about testosterone. But before that, you know, I just want to talk about hot flashes for two seconds. And I think it really helps people to understand, you know, what is a hot flash? So I want you to think about in the back of your brain, you've got a thermostat and your thermostat is set at 98.6, right? We, we know that when we take our temperature, we're looking for 98.6. So when everything is perfect, we have a thermal neutral or a comfort zone of about four degrees. And so we can get two degrees hotter, nothing happens, two degrees colder, nothing happens. But if we go 2.1 degrees too high, we start to sweat to cool our body off. So a hot flash or a night sweat is our air conditioning coming on. And of course, if we get cold, what happens? We shiver to try to get warmer. So what happens in menopause with loss of estrogen is that our comfort zone gets really narrow. 0.4 degrees. So we go 0.2 degrees warmer. Those blankets at night in bed or next to our bed partner or the dog gets on the bed. We get just a little bit warmer and boom, our air conditioning comes on and we're sweating. Then we take off the cover. We go 0.2 degrees too low and now we're shivering. And so then we're getting up to change our pajamas and then forget it. The rest of the night is history. So that's what happens. And with, with estrogen and with a new drug coming down the pipeline, 
um, that thermal neutral zone is widened back out again. So you feel normal in terms of your hot flashes. So it's yeah, think of it as being your thermostat is just not very good. And the heat comes on, then the air conditioning comes on, then the heat comes on. Not a very efficient nor comfortable way to live. Right. And women with loss of estrogen and menopause say that, you know, they're always a little too hot, a little too cold. And then let's say a woman gains five to 10 pounds. That's like wearing a sweater or a parka she can't take off. So of course she's always gonna be warm. And I'll have patients who are really thin who say, I don't have hot flashes, but I get these cold shivers. Well, yeah, because you don't have any insulation. And so your body is constantly trying to warm up. So again, we just want to make it so you don't have to think about this. Um, so, hey, Lori, love that you're here. So we'll get to that question. Um, Carolyn, we were going to talk about testosterone, so we might as well just click into this right now, and then we'll come back to um, Ann and Lori. But um, testosterone is critical. Dr. Simon actually is a world-renowned expert, seriously, on testosterone therapy. So I'll let him t speak to this. But also, the, just number one, the pellet's bad. We have ways to safely give you testosterone, and I do not recommend the pellet. But. So, so one of the things that's very important is that testosterone is a female hormone. It's not a male hormone. It's a female hormone as well. And women make bucket loads of testosterone, even compared to the amount of estrogen they make, literally every day of their adult lives prior to menopause. And by the time they're in menopause, it's about 50% of what they made when they were 20. But they're still making testosterone. Testosterone has a lot of benefits, and there's benefits for muscle strength, muscle weakness, bones, heart, all kinds of benefits. But the primary focus of testosterone has and continues to be on women's sexual interest and sexual function. And arousal. Yeah, right. Function. The problem with pellets that Dr. Bittner was alluding to is we don't know how to control the amount. And I have seen in my long career, because pellets have actually been around since before I was born, not kidding, um, we've, I have seen many, many women who start to look exactly like me with a beard and are balded. And that is not a good look on women in our culture. And that's directly related to the fact that they're getting too much testosterone from their pellets. The International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, Ishwish, Ishwish just came out with a paper explaining to doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers how to give testosterone safely to menopausal women. There's no need for pellets, there's safe and effective ways to give testosterone to postmenopausal women to get the desired effects without the side effects. Exactly. And, the, you know, the big issue is that we really promote using FDA approved products for menopause medication. So the concern with compounded medications, and there's certainly a role in our world for compounded medications, but in terms of hormone medications, we know that it's really difficult from batch to batch to have the, the medications be consistent. And hormones are such a big deal. We wanna have consistency and even dosing. And so with compounded therapy, it's hard to know that we're always getting that same dose. With FDA approved medications, we know from patch to patch, pill to pill, it's always going to be the same. The issue that Dr. Simon has tried to fight at the government level for years is that there is no FDA approved product for women in terms of testosterone. There are FDA approved testosterone. How many FDA approved testosterone for men? About 33. And there's zero for women. And there are issues in the system that make that difficult. And again, the, the fight continues. But for right now, we don't have a product that's FDA approved for women. So what we do with the guidance of Dr. Simon and a team that he put together is that we use FDA approved testosterone for men at one tenth the dose in women. And there are several pharmacies that will split up a box of 30 packets to just sell one packet at a time. It's about 20 bucks a month for a woman to use a packet and just to use two to four drops a day. Um, we have to adjust sometimes the dose a little bit for body fat. Is That's what I've seen most commonly. 
I have a patient who is so low body fat, she's on one drop twice a week and her levels are perfect. Um, we don't check levels a lot. We just want to make sure a woman is safe. So once she's on it, we check a level. He's testing to see if I read the paper, right? Thank you for reading yes, the paper. Yes, I read the paper. So we check levels once. We just check a total testosterone um, and we want to make sure it's less than 70. So let's say a level is 40 and a woman still maybe has some symptoms. She has some room to go up a little bit. This other patient that I'm talking about with really low body fat, I started on two drops a day and her level within like a month was at 240. So we stopped it for a week or two, started back at a lower dose. And uh, interesting about her is not only did it help her feel better, but her she had osteoporosis. She had already had her fragility fracture. She didn't tolerate any of the medications for osteoporosis. And her bone mass has improved using just the testosterone and with a really healthy lifestyle as well. So testosterone can be very good and safe and uh, a good choice. Yeah, we just don't want you to um, use too much because a uh, bald and bearded woman is not uh, well yeah, accepted yeah. in our society yeah. these days. <clears throat> but also it can make your and bad cholesterol unnecessary. go up. unnecessary. Yes, thank you. But it can also make your bad cholesterol go up. So again, it's make sure you're seeing a certified menopause practitioner who has access to this information and can help you do this safely. Um, Shanna, what is your definition of obese? The BMI charts take too few factors into account. So Shanna, I'm wondering how you're thinking about this relating to hormones, but definitely with the menopause transition, many women have a, a weight gain that doesn't make sense to them. They'll say, oh my gosh, I'm doing the same thing I always was doing and now I've gained weight. Well, it's because your body's changing, not your habits. Yeah, and, and by the way, for any uh, Asian Americans on this uh, call, there is a different BMI chart for them. It's not often used, but Asian Americans have a different body fat comp composition and distribution, and they should use a different BMI chart. Mm -hmm. uh, when we make these rules, they are usually focused on the one size fits all concept. And that might be where you're coming in with BMI, where my comment in, is about Asian Americans, and also where we started about the Women's Health Initiative results being for all women, for all cardiovascular, but not taking into account that a 50-year-old woman and a 79-year-old woman are very different health-wise. Right. And so when we think about the BMI charts, I totally agree. It takes too, fa too few factors. So for example, here at True, we have a scale that measures muscle mass, body fat percentage, visceral fat, which is that belly fat. And so, for example, I have patients who say, oh, look, my weight went up a little bit. My BMI went up a little bit because it's just a calculation of height versus weight. But look at my muscle mass went up and my fat mass went down and my visceral fat or my belly fat went down. So Shanna, you're exactly correct that BMI doesn't take those other very important factors. And so for example, we know that women who gain muscle mass, they actually have better insulin sensitivity, they have better sugar numbers, they have a lower risk of heart disease, and they're able to lose weight easier. So it's really important to you know, see a provider who can measure your muscle mass as well as your belly fat. Um, Go yeah, ahead, and I, I have a couple of patients who are really elite athletes, professional athletes, and they are way off the uh, charts, the BMI charts. In fact, they look to be overweight or obese on the BMI charts, and they don't have an ounce of fat on their entire bodies. Right, 100%. And Lori, I see you were just making a statement. So thank you for sharing. I love by Juva what a difference it's made to me. So I'm so glad that that can help because you are a busy mom and... Uh, you need to keep you feeling good for many reasons. Um, and I guess I don't see any questions. Oh, Beth asked a question. Missy, can you pop that up? Um, me again, no risk factors, no trouble with depression, sleep. It sounds like it would be best for me to circle back and advocate. Yes. Yes, we, we like <laughs> estrogen. It's natural. It's what your body is used to. It's what human bodies have been used to uh, since we were humans. And then you know, uh, most of our animal relatives, in fact, have the same issues with estrogen. So estrogen is safe. It's been evolutionarily proven to be effective and safe. And a low dose should be just fine for you without any risk factors. And by the way, 
it's been shown to improve depression, sleep, and a variety of what Dr. Bittner calls those under the hood or downstream effects. Exactly. And again, even Beth, just go to the website, menopause.org. You can even print off information for your primary care doc, um, you know, to talk about this. You know, what bothers me sometimes is that patients are almost shamed into it, into not using it, because again, it's a, it's a fear-based response. So on one hand, all the respect, your doctor wants to keep you safe, but potentially they haven't had time to check out the latest information and menopause.org does a really nice job. You know, I'd like to think too that True Women's Health is a true source of good information. And we have lots of past Facebook lives and, you know, on our YouTube channel and Facebook that talks about this. So again, please let us know how we can support. Um, Carolyn asked the questions, my dreams have been crazy on hormones. Will this get better? There's so many ways my brain goes on that. Um, if nothing else, are you sleeping better and you're waking up in the middle of a really good dream? So I don't know about crazy dreams. What yeah, do you know about I, I, I don't actually know what crazy dreams are. Sometimes crazy dreams are good. Sometimes crazy dreams are bad. The fact that you're dreaming usually means you're getting some good sleep and restorative sleep. Sometimes if you've just started on your hormones, you may have been sleep deprived for a long time and have a large deficit to fill in in terms of your sleep. Mm -hmm. So I think they probably will get better as you, um, you know, get more custom to whatever you're on. But uh, hard to know. Hard to know. Um, so I'm looking back at our list here. So this is a question that we get a lot. Does estrogen cause breast cancer? No, 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 it does not. No. Yeah, so one of the things under the hood that estrogen does, and we alluded to this earlier on in our conversation, estrogen causes cells to grow. Fertilizer. Fertilizer causes your skin, hair, and nails to grow. Well, who doesn't want more hair and who doesn't want better skin and who doesn't want better nails? I mean, let's be serious about that. Those are good things and a little tangential and cosmetic, and we don't like to think about that, but brain cells to grow, bones to grow, the internal healthy lining of the blood vessels to grow. And one of the things that most people, and women in particular, although it applies to men also, women have, about eight women in 100 have, a breast cancer that's in their breast that is too small to be detected on a standard mammogram. And if one takes fertilizer, estrogen, it's gonna make that grow as well. Skin, hair, nails, bones, brain cells grow. And it may appear on her next mammogram. It wasn't caused by the estrogen, it just made it grow to the point that it could be detected. And if women get routine screening, routine mammograms, that new breast cancer. Newly found. Newly cancer. found, right. Not newly caused, newly found breast cancer actually is one of the most sensitive to 100% cure because it's found early. Right. And so, for example, if patients come in and say, well, my mom had a, an estrogen-fed tumor, and so, and her doctors told her the estrogen caused it. So I'll say again, the estrogen didn't cause the cancer to start, but it could have made the cancer grow. So does it change survival? No. And a big study just came out a couple of years ago, right? That looked at the 20 year follow-up from the WHI study. And it showed that women who had a cancer found after starting the hormones did not have a change in their survival rate. So it's not like the estrogen hurt them either way. Correct. And there are many other studies that actually show that women whose breast cancers are found early stage, early grade, and they're on hormone therapy actually have a better, not worse, disease-free and more likely to be a survivor of their cancer. Right. So it's not a good thing, not a bad thing. It's just the way it is. Estrogen makes stuff Grow. And on that note, you know, when women start, let's say by Juva, let's say they've been in menopause for a year, they come in and see me, they start by Juva, which is the oral estrogen progesterone. 
yes, they're going to have some breast tenderness. And I say, well, your breasts have been had estrogen for a little while. They're going to both wake back up, but it tends to be symmetrical. It tends to be a tenderness on both sides. And it might last for a couple of weeks and then just kind of settle down because again, those, that breast tissue woke back up. Um, but then it should say stable and, but it doesn't mean that anything bad is going on. So again, I think it's really important that we have informed consent. And one thing that all of our patients get, I tell them, it's not, I'm not your mom, I'm not your boss, I'm your partner in your health. And so I am here to offer you options. I'll say to them, I don't have any ego invested with what you do. I have so much ego invested that you know your options. And I'm just looking in our workbook here so you guys can get this workbook online, or if you come to True, then you'll you'll get this workbook as a patient. But all the symptoms that happen are up here. You don't have to read this. I just want to show you to demonstrate. And then all the treatment options are here. And there's another page where, again, we have symptoms and wrong side, and we have treatment options. And so and there's check marks on what there are, are indications for and what we use for off-label. So again, it's I want the information to be in your hands because you're the boss of your body. And you deserve to know what we know. This is not rocket knowledge, science. Knowledge is power. Yes, sir. Knowledge is power. And so it's so important that you take this into your own hands and ask those questions. I see Laura's asked two questions. Um, Laura says, I hope there's a better delivery system for testosterone in the near future. I know, Laura, that tube is such a pain in the butt. Um, Laura, meet Dr. Simon. Dr. Simon, meet Laura. Um, Hi, Laura. So Laura's always a... a in our audience and has great questions, but you know, it's a pain in the butt, but it's what we got. So, you know, hopefully Dr. Simon and, and other people in his position on the national scale can, can continue to keep this fight up. Although I am on the advocacy committee for Ishwish, so need to work on that as well. But, but truly we need to work to get the FDA to support testosterone for women. And of course, write your senators, might help. They might know somebody on the FDA. Yeah. If you, if any of you on this call have a very close relationship with uh, either of the senators from Michigan or uh, an elected congressman or woman from Michigan and want to uh, shoot that information to me, happy to have it. And uh, we're actively trying to get the rules changed to be more like the rules for men so that women can have more FDA approved testosterone options. Right now, the rules are very different for men and women. And the rules that we have in place for women are so burdensome that we're unlikely to be able to get products past them. It's just too expensive and costly from the timing point of view. Right, exactly. So Laura, you're asking if the Bijuva is different than the topical estrogen. So again, yes, again, it, it, it's a pill. It goes in um, through the blood, for the stomach, to the liver, to the blood. And so there's a different um, transmission rate. And again, the only the other issue with Bijuva is it only comes, right now, it only comes in one dose. So if the dose you're using is lower than one milligram, then it's better to use the patch to make sure we can kind of keep the lowest dose that's effective for you. So that's the difference. So, you know, if you're happy with what you're doing, Marianne says, I'm using vaginal cream to relieve dryness based on your under the hood comment, wondering if I need more. So Marianne, a lot of times it's a bigger question in the sense of um, how long has it been since you had menopause? How long in terms of systemic or oral? So when you use vaginal cream at the right dose or the vaginal insert called Invexi, um, those don't go in your blood. And so they'll only treat the symptoms under the hood in Lady Town, you know, the vulva, the vagina, the bladder, uh, and it can help with vaginal um, dryness, painful intercourse, but also bladder urgency and maybe even rectal urgency. So it's only going to help down there. In terms of systemic, um, if you need more for the under the hood in the system, that would be considering your risk factors and if estrogen would be a good idea for you. And again, so important to see a certified menopause practitioner to go through those uh, risk factors. Yeah, one other thing, if uh, a proper amount of vaginal estrogen is helping a little but not enough, and there's residual dryness or pain with sex, it's important that that person actually have an exam. <laughs> it's not something we can do over virtual uh, healthcare because there are other reasons that women have pain with sex 
uh, or persistent dryness that require a careful examination of what did you call it? Lady, Lady Town. Town. Uh, yeah, Lady Town. And in order to make a diagnosis, and the treatment may be quite different for that person that has those residual symptoms. So examine Lady Town with pers persistent symptoms. Exactly. And here at True, we have mirrors in every room. When we do an exam, we have you hold the mirror and look down there as well. So many women have never done that. So it can be a little bit of a you know, new experience, but it's so important to know your anatomy. So for example, some women have a very specific sensitivity to lack of testosterone in Lady Town, um, especially we call it vestibulitis or pain with entry around the opening of the vagina. That tissue for some women can be very sensitive to lack of testosterone but also there's a very common skin condition called lichen sclerosis. And it just means where that skin gets sticky and it can turn white over time. Hence it's called lichen sclerosis in Latin means scarring. So there's this white scarring that happens. We recognize it really early before it becomes permanently disfiguring where the tissue just reabsorbs into itself. So again, it's so important to have an exam by someone who knows what they're doing. Um, and 15 years ago when I was doing regular OBGYN practice, I didn't recognize those symptoms. But now that I've had training at the Ishwish meetings that Dr. Simon was very um, critical in setting up, I now know. And um, those I work with, you know, we, we all know what we're doing. So again, you've got to advocate for yourself. Um, I'm looking at my other lists here. What I guess I'd like to do, I can't believe we're already at um, 40 minutes. So let's get into tips. So I always like to give you five takeaway tips that you can walk away here with. Um, and tip number one is know your phase of ovarian function. So it's so important. Again, critical work that Dr. Simon did with other leaders and NAMs is to come up with the straw. So the straw looks at the stages of aging um, across um, all different socioeconomic, genetic backgrounds, but it looks at the aging and it gives us a way to, use, to, to have names, nomenclature for these stages. And so we talk about reproductive stages versus perimenopause versus menopause. Um, and if a woman joins True and is using our True app, we actually walk through an algorithm based on your periods. And if you've had an ablation or an IUD or hysterectomy, there are other ways we can check this out. But you've got to know your ovarian function. So then you know, number one, what to expect. And number two, when to consider maybe using a hormone medication. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think these days, many women have an IUD in place. Uh, don't have periods anymore or have had very little in the way of menstruation as they've uh, gotten to menopause. And uh, it may be difficult for them to know when actual menopause is. Menopause, the cessation of menstruation is menopause. And uh, Dr. Bittner is absolutely right. We can do blood work to find out where that woman is in her transition, uh, factor in the uh, different a symptom she's having and make a new plan together. Yep. And again, that's why I love here at True, we have our app that allows women to track their symptoms over time. And so it's looking at symptoms, it's looking at habits, and then how can we can track those? And that helps tell the story. You know, I always say that if doctors are checking hormone levels a lot, it means that perhaps they don't know much about the stages. We can tell a lot just from the history. So it's taking a good history and putting that together with an occasional blood test. And Barb, just real quick, I see um, that you're asking if this is recorded. Yes, it is. Um, and it will be on our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook and also Dr. Simon's um, links with Intima Medicine. So those links are all on the side. So yes, and please share this with other people. We just want to reach as many women as we can. Okay, tip number two. So it's take the MTS. So the MTS is a scale that is able is can be used to measure your symptoms. There are seven questions in the menopause transition scale. And um, we have a link to this on the website. You can go in and, and take this one time for yourself. And so basically a three is good or not distressing or predictable and a one is bad, you're miserable, it's really difficult. And so you can take this over and over and over to see if whatever you're choosing to do, even just drink more water, if that makes a difference. If losing some weight, if that makes a difference. If you take a hormone medication, if that makes a difference. So this scale has been validated, but it'll be really fun to see over time, tracking with our patients, you know, does this really work to track patients over time? Um, uh, 
Keep track. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Good. Tip number three, have a goal. Can't get to a goal if you don't know what it is. Have a goal. <laughs> there you go. And here at True, we use picture of self. So how I like to think about it, just because my brain works in pictures, is to picture yourself at a future event. So for example, I always use my birthday. It's in August. I've used this my whole life. You know, at my birthday, how do I want to be? So next year on August 1st, I want to be strong and vibrant and have good energy. So to reach that goal, what do I have to do to get there? I'm not having any more birthdays, so uh, <laughs> I don't uh, have goals around birthdays. But Different uh, milestone yes, events. Different milestone events. Uh, and, and nothing happens overnight. Have a reasonable time horizon for whatever your goal is and make changes that you can have permanently mm -hmm. or legitimately as part of your everyday life. Unrealistic goals are worse than no goals at all. Because they make us feel bad, right? That we're not reaching them. But the other thing too is think about why do you do those goals even from the short term? So, you know, if I'm starving, then I'm not gonna remember that I don't wanna have a heart attack when I'm 70, right? So when I'm starving, I want, healthy food. And if I've got good, healthy snacks, like a whenever bar or some brown rice with my salad, then I know that's going to keep me feeling good, not being hungry, and it's also helping me reach my goal. So it's also thinking about those short term things that that can make a difference and they're easy to do. So absolutely good. OK, tip number four. Take the seeds checklist. So the seeds are the seven essential elements of daily success. You can go to the website, the truewomenshealth.com website, and download the Seeds ebook. The Seeds ebook, I've got a lot of uh, friends and family and patients who have downloaded this and they have it right up in their bathroom or on the refrigerator. And basically, you know, people sometimes want a magic pill, like, what can I just do right now to just instantly fix? There is no magic pill, it is lifestyle. And this, this Seeds list captures it all. And uh, back in the study that I did in 2008, the pilot study of 114 women, women who just did their seeds, who chose not to take a hormone medication or they couldn't because of safety, they had had breast cancer, for example, or they took perhaps a, a, like a Lexapro or they didn't take anything. Just doing the seeds helped them feel better. So habits make a big difference. Absolutely. For example, even just writing down what you eat every day can actually help you lose weight just so that you can see and reflect on diet and exercise. So being conscious, being alert, being focused, having uh, your goals in mind is very helpful in achieving those goals. Agree. And having these seeds, although too, it's that accountability. So um, I know that Jim and I follow each other on my fitness pal. So that's one accountability. I started training with Mitch who we did a Facebook Live a couple months ago, and Mitch um, occasionally will have me send pictures of what I'm eating, so that certainly keeps me honest. Um, and then, of course, measuring the fat mass, you know, we can track things. But again, it's about having these healthy habits every day. And so, for example, I'm in menopause, I use the patch, I occasionally will get a night sweat, and what do I do? I go straight to the seeds. Did I drink my water? Eh, maybe not so well today. Did I have an extra glass of wine? Eh, maybe I did. Last night I had an extra glass of wine and had a night sweat. What are you going to do? So it was worth it. So then did I have sugar? Yes. So again, the seeds can be a really good checklist just to keep you on track. Tip number five, know your options for treatment. I don't think we can say this enough. Can't see that. Yeah. And, and my patients actually have failed most of the common treatment. So my job and patients, because, when they because, finally minute, get to me. because he's seeing the patients that Yes, haven't found answers anywhere else. So he's getting the patients who have, have tried everything. Right, but there are lots of things to try, which is the reason that we're having this, uh, this particular tip. Lots of things to try before you end up in my office. And you need to work through the list. That's the, right. Not everything is perfect for everyone, but there are multiple options almost for every woman. Right. And I do want to point out um, regarding the option of testosterone, um, Dr. Simon was quoted by the Washington Post yesterday. And so we're going to post the link to this. So again, you know, very happy that he is getting 
um, ask questions by the Washington Post, because again, our goal is to reach as many women as possible. All women deserve to know this information. So again, please share this conversation with your friends and family. Um, but even this article just brings, brings to bear that we've got to consider these options. Keep an open mind also. Thank you, that's good. So the next thing I always like to go into is five questions that you can ask your healthcare provider. Because again, those, these are things that Dr. Simon and I believe strongly that you need to know and you deserve to know. So question number one, again, ask your provider, what is my phase of ovarian function? Shouldn't be difficult if your provider looks at you and says, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, you might want to find someone a little more comfortable and expert on this issue. And again, it takes a village. So not all of us have the time or energy or interest to have this training. That's why we then have to work together. And unfortunately, some physicians, you know, we're, we're trained to know it all, to do it all. And it takes a, a, a what's the word? It takes Healthcare a healthy, team. It takes a team, but it takes a healthy ego for a physician to say, I don't know. And um, I, I think it's really important that we all stay in our lane, that we all do what we, you know, if you ask me about the latest hypertension medicine, I'm gonna tell you, talk to Dr. Egan, my partner, because that's her lane, or Suzanne, that's her lane, that's not my lane. So we have to know what we're good at and do what we're good at. And in the, in, you know, in the end, I see healthcare as the woman's in the middle, and all of us providers are like spokes of a wheel around her. And so our job is to support you you know, not for us to do everything for everybody. Absolutely. Totally agree. Uh, and if you're in this area or in Washington, there are a multitude of choices of practitioners who can be brought in as consultants with your primary doc or, or people here at True who can help if there are special issues that need to be attended to. 100%. Perfect. Okay. Question number two. Bless you. What is my risk to develop heart disease or stroke? Now here at True, we do this screening all the time. So we use, for example, there's a risk score that's right in our medical chart called ASCVD risk score. We use a Reynolds score, which is more gender specific, looking at family history and a blood test called a CRP. Um, if you get the True Women's Health, the, the workbook, the I Want to Age Like That workbook, there's all the questions um, that we ask and the blood tests that you need to calculate the scores for yourself. So again, if you ask your provider and that's not something they're comfortable with, there are tools that you can measure your own risk. So if a provider says, well, you know, I don't think you should take hormones because of your risk for heart disease, we'll say, what is my risk for heart disease? Um, and it's so important to know that. So for example, I've had several patients who their cholesterol is a little high their blood sugar is a little high, but not so bad. Their weight is a little high, but not so bad. Um, but they're very interested. And of course, I'm very interested in their risk of heart disease. Um, a, a certain patient is in my mind um, and she really did want to know. And, and we were talking about hormones. So I asked her to have another test done called a CAC or a calcium score. It's a very low radiation dose uh, CAT scan of the heart and it looks at calcium in the blood vessels around the heart. Now, us girls tend to do heart disease a little different than men. We tend to put plaque in the wall before we put it in the, in the lumen. And I love the example of uh, Dr. Barry Murr. She says that guys leave their socks in the hallway and us girls tend to hide our socks in the closet. So we put our plaque in the walls. And so a calcium score can be really important. So this patient I'm thinking of, you know, again, her cholesterol was kind of high. We did a calcium score and her calcium score was already positive. So at 53 years old, she was already putting plaque in the wall and it was a game changer for her in terms of, I've got to get my act together. So it was still safe for her to start hormone medication, but boy, she has rocked it out in terms of weight loss. She's gotten her muscle up. It was a real game changer for her to know the information. Yeah. Got to know the information. Again, knowledge is power. And you can't manage if you don't measure. There you go. All right. Next question, number three, what is my risk for breast cancer? Your number one risk for breast cancer is being a woman. Your number two risk factor for, for getting breast cancer is the older you get, the risk goes up. Um, but outside of that, it's very important to do risk screening. So here at True, we do a Gale model and we do a Tyrocusic, can never say that. So we do risk factor screening for breast cancer. And for example, we are missing a lot of women who have a genetic risk. So here at True, we also do genetic screening 
for risk of breast cancer. I would imagine you do that as well. And um, so it's really important that if you do have a high risk that you're that that you have access to high risk screening and it can make some decision making about the timing of hormone medication, et cetera. And, and a woman's risk of breast cancer is to some degree under her control. Thank you. We don't uh, take ownership of that fact enough. For example, alcohol intake increases your risk of breast cancer. Your body weight increases your risk of breast cancer. You can't change your age or who your parents were, but you can change your consumption of alcohol and your body weight. So these are just two examples of things that women can change to control their lifetime risk of breast right. cancer. And um, what's really interesting, again, this, I was reminded of this at our menopause uh, convention. Can you imagine that, a menopause convention? But we were there last week in Washington, and um, the point was made that some women are concerned about the risk of breast cancer on the synthetic progesterone in the WHI, which was about five per 10,000. So the risk of two glasses of wine a day, a sedentary lifestyle, and being obese, you know, having especially belly fat or a waist circumference greater than 35, those risk factors are greater than the risk of taking synthetic progesterone. So again, sometimes I'll ask my patients, you know, do you want breast cancer? And they're, they're, they're like, are you kidding me? Why would you ask me that question? And I'm like, well, the two glasses of wine you're drinking every day actually tell me that you're okay with breast cancer. Again, most women don't know that. So I don't mean disrespect, but on the other hand, I want to bring home the point that some of this is in our control. So very important. Um, I want to make sure I'm not missing any questions. Oh, Laura, thank you. I appreciate you very much. Okay, question number four. Are you is, yes, I am a certified menopause practitioner, but I want you to ask your healthcare provider, are you a certified menopause practitioner? There's only 11 to 1200 certified menopause practitioners across the country. We wish more and more people would be interested and take this test. You know, one of the issues with being a menopause practitioner, so for example, myself, um, I was a busy OBGYN delivering babies, doing surgeries. That's considered a high margin or a high profit area of medicine. Talking to patients is not. So, so this is the problem is that we need to really support quality-based care, healthcare that makes a difference for your overall health. So more and more people, we need to value primary care and people who are spending time to talk to patients. Yeah, the other thing is that we in medicine tend to get very siloed in our areas of training. So if you're trained as a gynecologist, you have one set of information. If you're trained by, if you're trained as an internist, you might have a completely different set of information. If you're trained as a family physician, the information may be similar to both of those, but yet different. And the menopause practitioner, a certified menopause practitioner, has a little of all of those lumped together in a single test that if you can pass it, you really know the core information that every practitioner needs mm -hmm. to know to take optimal care of women transitioning through menopause and aging. Very well said. And it's all evidence-based. And so what I love as well is that the papers, the evidence that's, that's um, put forth for one to study to pass this test is that there are grades of evidence. So the best study is one that's done prospectively, meaning I'm gonna take a patient, put her on placebo, a patient not on placebo, an active drug, and see what happens over time. Um, but so we can look at the levels of evidence, but it's really important that we, again, we know our stuff and there's evidence to back it up. Okay. Question number five. This is again, for you to ask your provider, what is your understanding of hormone replacement therapy? What are the pros and cons for me personally? Again, at True, we go through with each patient informed consent. That means these are the pros, these are the cons, these are the options. What do you want to do? And so it's really important. I had a patient recently came to me and said, my doctor said I can't have hormones because his grandma had breast cancer. Okay. So again, it's important that you ask your provider what your risks are. And again, if that's not in their lane, it's okay. Ask for a referral or look up for a provider yourself. Yeah. And coming for full circle from where we started talking about the Women's Health Initiative, that study of 20 years ago, 
that study specifically excluded women who were having hot flashes, night sweats, and disturbed sleep. So <laughs> most women come to ask about hormones because they're having night sweats, hot flashes, and disturbed sleep. So when someone applies the results of that study to that woman, it's apples and oranges. And we need to make personal decisions on the pros and cons that are specific to the woman sitting in front of us. Yes. So there you go. And we're at an hour. I cannot believe this. I think you and I could talk about this for hours. Um, we're just so honored that you took out the time to join us today. Um, again, I know it went a bit long, so hopefully you can watch it in batches if necessary. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to put them on, on um, our True site or Dr. Simon's Intima Medicine site. Um, you see his uh, website right there. Feel free to ask questions, look us up, ask questions, be informed, and we wish you um, healthy aging. Any Absolutely. Lovely to be here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care.